Hello and welcome to another Knitting Pod. I am Lena and I am so glad you're here with me today. I have so much to share with you. If you were here last week, you know that I did a 2023 year in review where we did a little show and tell about everything I knit last year. And that's why I have so much to show you today because I didn't show you any of these things last week. So I've made a lot of knitting progress. I have a lot of fun stuff to share with you. Um, let's not dilly-dally, let's jump right in. Um, let's first talk real quick about a few things that you guys really helped me with last week. Um, like I said, I showed you everything I knit and one of the things that I almost forgot to show you that I knit was these Painting Brick Socks by Stephen West. These were my first socks ever and I almost forgot to show you last week, but I'm glad I did because I told you guys how much trouble I had with sizing. I had measured the circumference of the widest part of my foot and subtracted several inches and knit that size, but somehow I think it's probably because this is, um, it's not color work, but there's a lot of, you know, slip stitches and stuff like that. And that always, to me at least, creates a little bit of a looser tension. And so I think I was, I did not measure my gauge and I think it was just pretty loose. So a lot of you had said, a lot of you experienced sock knitters had said you would wash them and throw them in the dryer. And that is exactly what I did. And it was just such an improvement. Um, from especially in the foot, it feels so much better in terms of it's a lot snugger. The place it's still not snug enough to me is this cuff. And I am wondering if it's number one, just gravity, that this thing that's up is gonna slowly come down. Also, I wonder if having a double cuff has made it, I don't know, heavier and therefore trying to pull down. Also, I think if this was just smaller generally it would work better so I have a trip coming up next week and I just I'm always jealous of knitters who are able to enjoy socks because they're such a small portable project I have no desire to lug around any of the larger projects that I have going on it just ends up like my my carry-on on the plane just ends up so big so I'm determined to do a pair of socks um, and I think it'll be fun because I haven't done one in over a year now um, and again y'all were very helpful with your tips and tricks about socks and one of you said that you found that um, holding two strands of fingering weight together and knitting a DK weight sock gave a denser fabric, and I think that's what I'm going to do. I have several little balls of fingering weight yarn that were pulled out of, an, of another project that are already wound up together, and I feel like this would be a perfect place to use them because I'm not sure where else... I would use them and I don't want them to go to waste and they're really pretty and I think they would um, end up in a pretty marled sock situation. I wish I had them here. I forgot them in my room, but um, I think I'm going to do, so a couple of you had mentioned the crazy sock lady, which, wow, she really is a crazy sock lady. She's so into socks. Um, and she had a free DK weight vanilla sock also, Darling Stephen West has a free DK weight sock also. So I looked at both of the patterns and it looks like Stephen West has a larger range of sizes. And what I'm gonna do is knit the smallest size he has. Um, I'm just experimenting. I don't know if it'll work out, but being a loose knitter, I feel like it's going to. The other thing that someone had told me was um, to knit a sock and ribbing, and I happen to have Andrea Mowry's DRK, DRK, yes, D DRK Everyday Sock in my library already, and that is a toe-up sock that's done in ribbing, and I almost went with that one, but I like the idea of trying to do a thicker sock, and I just... 
since I did this as a Stephen West sock and I really felt comfortable with this heel turn and the gusset and all that, I feel like his would be very similar to this and I was comfortable with this and confident. So I feel like I'm just gonna stick with the Stephen West one. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do for my um, travel project, especially on the plane. I don't think I'm confident enough to think I'm gonna only take that because I am not a monogamous knitter at all. I love having multiple things on the needles. So I've got some other stuff I'll show you that I'm possibly gonna take. Um, otherwise I might cast on a hat, um, but you know, that's kind of up in the air right now. So I'm definitely gonna cast on a pair of socks. Thank you so much for all your feedback. This really is a space where when you tell me something and give me your thoughts, it really is helpful. You guys are my real life knitting friends. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do magic loop or if I'm gonna borrow my friend Jessica's little minis cause I don't have the size, but she does. Um, I always, I mean, I think it's like, so hard to decide because when you do magic loop, you're dealing with, you know, turning and pulling the cord out and all that stuff. However, you get a full size needle. When you're doing the shorties, you're just going round and round, but you really do have to kind of keep your fingers a little tighter because the tips are so small. So I haven't figured out what I'm going to do yet. I might even, I don't know. I really just don't know what I'm going to do yet. But Thank you for helping me make these better fitting. And what I have found is that when I'm wearing leggings, full length leggings, and I pull these up over my leggings, they stay really well. It's almost like the cuff sticks to the fabric of the legging and then they stay up and I wear my Birkenstocks and I think they look really cute because you get a show off a fun hand knit and they're super cozy and comfortable. And I just, I really like wearing them that way. And now that the foot wears better, it just feels better. So thank you to you guys for that. Um, next, there was another piece that I showed you last week, the Soldotna crop that was my, it's one of my favorites. I just think this is so stunningly beautiful. I, it's just the colors, the pattern, everything is so beautiful. And I got so many comments on the fact that y'all thought that too. And some of you thought it was fine and I was being too critical of it. Others were like, yeah, that's super flared. After reading all of it and you know revisiting how pretty it is, I really do think I'm going to rip out this ribbing. What I think I'm gonna do is take my teeny tiny needle and pick up, before I start ripping out the needle, there is one row between this little turquoise and whatever color this is. Between this and this orange row, there is one row of pure charcoal gray. And I'm going to go around and pick that entire thing up. And then I'm going to attempt to unpick the ribbing and rip it out. And not only am I going to, I'm not going to just add ribbing again and make it cropped. I'm just going to go ahead and go through the effort of making it longer. I have put so much effort into this yoke and I bought yarn for this. This was not leftover yarn. So this is like $140 of yarn. And I have, I looked in my stash and I have these colors. So I, there's nothing stopping me from extending the length. So just, I think if I extended the length and if I actually went all the way and added sleeves, I think it would be one of my favorite sweaters. It's such a beautiful piece. And I think it's worth that extra effort, even though I don't want to do it. I think I just should because otherwise I'm just not going to wear it. I, I like somebody said you could wear it under overalls or she said dungarees. I had to look that up because I didn't know what dungarees were, but I still think I have some, you know, onesie kind of things, but the armhole is long and I think it's going to create like this weird triangle. And then if I had something that comes up, it's gonna be bunched. It's just, 
I really think I need to suck it up, Buttercup, and make it longer. And you know what? It's a live and learn situation. I love seeing other people wear those cute crop sweaters over dresses, and I, it just doesn't feel good to me. So I think I'm going to go ahead, be a big girl, and add what I need to add. So thank you for that feedback. I really thought that episode was going to be just for you guys, but ended up being really fun for me to get y'all's feedback. Also, just to revisit all those knits was such a treat, and it just, um, it was a really fun episode. So that was very helpful um, to hear your thoughts on that. So that's that on that episode. It is now in the past. I will keep you updated. I don't have like a timeline as to when I'm going to do that, but I shall do it sooner than later, I hope. Especially just because I don't want to be doing it in the summer and then I don't have like the reward of wearing it. So hopefully I get it done soon. Um, what else is on my needles? I think I'm going to show you that second. I'm going to show you this first. If you recall, I, first of all, how hilarious this is. This is an enormous ball of Julie Asselin in the Nurtured Base because I ripped some stuff out to get this yarn back and I am very lazy. I can't be bothered to wash the yarn and rewind it. Absolutely not. It went straight back into here. But it is now the, I just never know how to pronounce this name, Callius Cardigan by Isabel Kramer. I've made a lot of progress on it since you last saw it. I think since you last saw it, I was on one of the front panels. Well, it's been quite the journey, but at least now both front panels are done. We're joined in the round and we are working the whole body right now. Um, this is a beautiful, deceptively simple looking cardigan. Let me show you some of the features that I really like about it. I love this beautiful back panel with the slip stitch ribbing because it looks so clean and beautiful and unique and almost brioche like I said to you said this to you guys last time it really has a brioche look and I love a brioche look without brioche and the other really lovely thing about this cardigan is that it has a built-in collar band so if you look at this cardigan that I'm wearing this is the Ginny cardigan by Andrea Mowry you knit the entire thing and then you have to pick up 3,482 stitches to add a collar on, which is hands down my least favorite thing to do. Um, and then you, the collar itself was quick because it's just a uh, stock and net, but it's just not fun. And I think there was some short row shaping. But in this beautiful cardigan, you are knitting this collar band thing as you go. So there is no picking up 4 million stitches at the end. You're just enjoying this variation. So this band is the same slip stitch ribbing and it's like slowly tapering and it matches the back. And then this panel of stock and net is, you know, the body. What clever construction, right? It's really, really lovely. I have to say, a couple of stumbling blocks that I ran into was I have the habit of only, I always gauge swatch for a sweater, live and learn the hard way. I always gauge swatch, but I only look at the, the stitch count this way, right? Very rarely do any of any patterns really ask you to do row gauge because you can just extend you know row gauge by adding or subtracting length very easy however the way this cardigan was when I was on each panel what was it it was I, I can't really remember but it basically gets you to this point I think you're like increasing or something and then it says you're gonna start tapering this band where you're stealing stitches from this side to extend out this part. And it says to do that until, for the smallest size, it was like eight and a half inches. 
And when I started that section, when I was about to start that section, I measured it and I was already at 10 and a half inches. So I was just so confused and I, I went back and I was like, am I measuring from the right place? Am I off? I could not figure out where I had gone wrong. I sent it to Jessica. She spent a whole bunch of time, you know, combing through the pattern and trying to figure out. And we both just came to the conclusion that I had not missed anything but I was so off on my row gauge. When I went back and measured my slip stitch ribbing versus hers, I had 15 rows and she had 30 per four inch. I still don't quite know how that's possible, but I can't figure out how to measure that any other way that makes any sense. And it made sense why I was so off on that. So long story short, I apologize for waxing on and on about this. However, I couldn't find a single project on Ravelry that had that same problem. And it just seems like I couldn't be the only one, but apparently I was. However, we conferred and figured out that it really is just a giant box. There's not a lot of shaping, so it really didn't matter. So I just skipped that entire section joined in the round and started that tapering of the collar at that point. And it's worked out totally fine. Um, this is what I love about a top down. There's no mystery. Like I was able to join and then start trying it on and it fits really nicely. I'm really happy with the fit because it's not terribly oversized, which I tend to struggle with. The other mistake I made in my you know, trying to manage all these mistakes that I had made that weren't mistakes, but they were just, I was not matching the pattern. I didn't read her join round carefully enough. And she says to join with six underarm stitches and I only joined with three. So I have less underarm stitches, which again is fine for me because I have such a, you know, small bust that I don't need a lot of underarm stitches because I don't need that extra room. So it fits totally fine. But again, close reading sometimes is somewhere I struggle. Sometimes I think with patterns I get excited or I assume I know what I'm doing and sometimes it's worth slowing down and kind of especially when it's like a dense paragraph and you just are taking your assumed knowledge into it, you know, it's good to slow down. This has been an exercise in trusting that I have knit enough garments that I know how to redeem it, even if it's not matching exactly. So there has definitely been some more, you know, wading through with my own, you know, interpretation and kind of knowledge than in other garments, but it's been fun. I will say as beautiful as this slip stitch ribbing is, it is pretty um, acrobatic in terms of, this is where Norwegian Pearl has been a lifesaver because with the Norwegian Pearl, you don't bring the yarn to the front. You, if it's knit one, purl one, you are just knitting one and then keeping the yarn in the back and that reducing of that bringing the yarn back and forth has been a lifesaver on my hands however the row after that you have to do knit one slip one with yarn in front so you there's no getting around the bringing the yarn back and forth and I found that it's it's very it ends up with a lot of tension in my hands whether it's because I'm having to move the yarn back and forth plus it's a very dense worsted weight yarn and I had to drop my needle size to get gauge to a four millimeter. So it's just, it's a very dense fabric and I find that that tends to take more of a toll on my hands and my those tiny muscles in my hands. So this is another place where I think it's extraordinarily helpful to have multiple projects going on at the same time. There's an author, named, I think his name is Carson Deemers. He's written some books on knitting ergonomics and 
I was reading an interview with him and it said just how it's really important to mix up the materials we use and the size of yarn and needles and all that that we're knitting with. And that keeps, that keeps our hands much healthier because just the change from a worsted weight yarn to a fingering weight, or if you're knitting with linen and then your other project is wool, it keeps your hands from getting strained in the same way over and over and over. And I have found that that is so true. I could have a very knit heavy day, but if it was just this, by the end of the day, my hands are gonna be wrecked. Whereas the other project I have is super wash and fingering weight, which is just a completely different experience than something like this, which is not super wash, much denser, and just seems to take a toll. So I highly encourage you to have two or three projects. Well, I have like a lot of projects on the needles at all times, but that keeps my mind and my hands happy. Um, the other thing I will say is I think because of that kind of fighting the yarn feeling, I don't, I'm not tempted to just work on this and it's, it kind of feels like slow going at this point. And every time I try it on, I feel like, wow, I thought I'd be further along by now, but you know, I need to just not rush it. I, I think I'm just so excited because I think I will love having um, this in my closet because I think I'll wear it so much. I love a cardigan to throw on. I thought this was going to be that useful cardigan that I wear all the time, but this taught me that I like a lot roomier in the arms. Like this fits perfectly fine, but it's just, I don't like that feeling of fabric as a second skin. You know, maybe if it was a less itchy fiber, but this is a fairly itchy fiber. This is hedgehog fibers in their Tweety base. It just has an itch factor that makes it kind of like, oh, and it's too snug for me to wear like a shirt under it. So I I need a gray cardigan that's loose fitting and comfortable. And I'm really, really, really hopeful that this is it. The other thing I think I might do is if as I'm gonna get a little bit further on the body and then I might put the body on hold and do the sleeves first because I have a limited, like I don't wanna to have to buy more yarn and I don't wanna make the body and then realize, like I can always crop the body, but I don't, I can't crop the arms, you know what I mean? So I think I might just jump in and do the arms, the sleeves rather, the arms, the sleeves. Um, first and then finish the body. Um, but it's a really simple, lovely pattern that has just enough interest and is simple enough to be super wearable. So I'm really excited about this. Okay, I need a sip of water. My throat feels dry from all the talking. I'm so excited to show you the next thing on my needles because it's just been such a breath of fresh air from the more like a monochromatic utilitarian kind of piece. And I was telling Jessica, we had lunch together yesterday and I was telling her that I kind of don't even care if this is wearable in my even semi-regular life because it's just, it's so much more about the process, but let me just show you. This is the Bubbles and Brio Shawl by the delightful Stephen West, who brings his colorful heart to all his patterns. And it's the more I knit widely across other designers, the more I appreciate the singular place he holds in the knitting world. Um, for me, at least, I just really, really enjoy having pieces like this on my needles because it's just purely joyful. So last time I showed you this piece, I was only here at this brioche part, which is just so cute. I wish I could stretch it out better. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hold it this way, duh. This is the little brioche section um, that's so pretty. And then now I'm on the beautiful bubble section. Well, I finished this bubble section. 
What I love about the bubble pattern is that it is so, 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 so simple, but so impactful. And not only, I love color, but I love color combined with texture even more. And the way that the bubbles bubble is just too cute. It's just so much fun. And I love the interplay of the colors. I like all the scraps I've used because there's a little bit of everything. There's some pastel, there's some deep colors, there's some bright, there's some toned down neutrals. And I just think it looks really pretty. Then the second section is just easy peasy garter, um, a real break from anything that you need to, it's just autopilot knitting that you're not gonna be concerned at all that you're messing up. And now I'm on this other brioche section. I'm just being absolutely um, following my heart with the colors. I'm not repeating the order. I even threw in this minty color here just for fun because I thought it went really beautifully, but there's eight bubble stripes in each section. Um, I am on the fifth right here. And then there's another brioche section, which I look forward to um, because I, like I said last time, really enjoy brioche when it's just a section in a shawl like this because I think it just adds something that is so special. And, you know, if you are someone, like, you know, when you wear a shawl and there's movement and stuff, I think the back of the brioche is so incredibly beautiful also. Um, even the back of the bubbles is cute, right? It just looks, it's like this little concave. I don't know. It's just really neat looking. So, and I like how when you stretch it, you get that, that spine kind of looking thing. I just think it's so funky and cool. So this piece has been so much fun to, you know, pick up when I need something more uplifting and even like it's it doesn't look like it would be but it's actually quite useful for even just sitting in carpool and waiting and stuff because you don't have to carry around all the bubbles because when I go pick up the kids or take them somewhere I know I can just take the one color I'm using and um, make a little progress on this beauty what I love also about it is it's just, it's not something I'm in a rush to finish. It's kind of just in the background. I've made a lot of progress as you can see, but I also, you know, I'm gonna start socks and I'm not, I'm not like rushing to get this off the needles. I'm just enjoying it as a background knit. But as you can see, all these colors, I'm not going to take all these yarn balls to Portland when I go next weekend. So this will not be making the trip. I also don't really want to do brioche because if I mess up, I would, I don't want to be fussing on something um, when I'm distracted by other things in my life. So the bubbles and brioche, uh, highly recommend all scraps and half, you know, skeins of yarn from my stash. It's just a fabulous way to use up yarn that you have lying around that we all have lying around. Um, on that note, I just cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed my commitment to using the yarn I have. I have felt like I've missed absolutely nothing. I feel like it's just such, it's actually more fun because I don't have, I have taken buying yarn off the table, so I just how do I put what I'm feeling? Like, it's almost like having some constraints allows me to play more. Whereas if I was like, oh, maybe there's this other color I wanna use and I have to buy, it, it opens the world too much. It's like having the constraints allows you to be creative within a box almost. I don't know. I'm not communicating that well, but I am really enjoying it. I have so much yarn and for sure you could buy a kit and make this, but you by no means need to. I'm a hundred percent certain every single last one of you has enough yarn to make a fabulous, perfect version of this. So 
I am loving knitting from my stash. Like even this cardigan, the Callias or Callias or whatever, it, that has been yarn that has wanted to be, I, it is, this is the third thing it's wanted to be. And I'm just determined to make it work this time, but it's just such a, I love the feeling of using the things I have. I guess that's the long, that's the short way of saying a very long thing. So you will see this grow in its own time, but it has been so fun. Oh, maybe I should tell you what some of these scraps are. This dark gray is a, I believe, 100% alpaca. The white is a merino. It's much lighter in weight, so you can see how the gray stripes are more, um, you know, they're thicker and the white is a little bit finer and I actually like that. It gives it more dimension and you can even see that interplay in the brioche. Then the scraps are various things, singles, which I think shawls are a great place to use up the singles you have because, you know, they don't make good socks. They don't, you know, they're much more delicate and I think our shawls get much lighter wear. So I would encourage you to use up your singles and I think like half of these colors are singles, meaning a single strand, not applied yarn. Um, there's some Pearl Soho. This is a Pearl Soho. This blue is a, called Line Weight. It's a very delicate single base. Um, this is some La Bienname, some Hedgehog Fibers. There's just a nice mix of beautiful colored sock yarn and singles bases. Okay, putting this bad boy up. I am very excited about showing you this next little thing that's on my needles. I don't know why, but I have gotten kind of obsessed with Sari Nordland. She, if you don't know who that is, is a Finnish designer who has just such an elegance about her. And I just love everything she makes. And a lot of things she makes are, or designs rather, are cabled. Very beautifully, like fully cabled sweaters and cardigans and so many hat patterns and stuff like that. So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you remember that that Julie Aslan yarn at one point wanted, was trying to become a cabled sweater. It was the Clarette sweater that I had cast on and I was so intimidated by the pattern, but I thought it was a good way to get started on some more intricate cabling because it was um, fully cabled, but you started by knitting the sleeves flat and that cabled pattern on the sleeves was echoed throughout the body. So it was, even though it looked really complicated, it was, it was really repetitive and I thought that would be a good thing for me. And sure enough, the beginning was quite a challenge to kind of get my brain to really commit to reading from a chart, to understanding the cables, to cabling without a needle. All that stuff was like a real um, learning curve. But once I got it, I just was bored to tears on the second sleeve because it was just so unbelievably repetitive and I could not fathom knitting the entire front panel, the entire back panel. It just, I couldn't do it. So I ripped it out. Long story short, I still had this like yearning to do a cable project, but maybe not a full sweater. I just felt like that was a bridge too far. And I saw that Sari Nordland had so many smaller projects that were intric intricately cabled. And I just really had this like yearning to knit something from her that was smaller and cabled. Enter her collar patterns. Now, I feel like in the knitting world, there are a lot of cowls. Um, just take Andrea Maury, for instance. She has so many, you know, cowl versions of a shawl. For instance, the more recent Traveler shawl, she now released a Traveler cowl. The Shift series, she had a night shift shawl and then she did a shift cowl. And basically it's kind of like the bunched up 
uh, triangular shawl, like mini shawl that you seam and it has kind of more of a bunched up and then the triangle hangs here. Well, sorry, Nordland's version of that is the collar, which is more like, rather than the bunched up look, it actually looks like the, the yoke of a sweater. And then often she has like a turtleneck or something like that, but it's just this part. And then the back kind of comes like this. I'll put a picture or, you know, a picture's worth a lot of my you know, already plentiful words. So a picture she'll do. Long story short, again, I swear I need to change the name of my channel to Long Story Knits, but that's words for another day. Um, I just became obsessed with this. First of all, she has this elegance that I do not possess. I don't dress in trench coats. I don't look so lovely as she does all the time in these pictures, at least. My aesthetic is more sweatshirt and leggings. <laughs> However, I realized like my favorite, I have two of the same sweatshirt that I just absolutely love. It's like this oversized, I've worn it on this podcast. It's the brand Aloe. It's just so soft and comfy. And I usually, you know, in the winter, I wear that with leggings and boots and a shawl and it's like my perfect uniform because I have a hand knit but I also have this like effortless sweatshirt. Then it uh, it occurred to me that actually one of those collars would be super cute because it would almost transform the sweatshirt into the look of having a knit sweater but without all the hullabaloo of bodies and sleeves. And I could enjoy some intricate cabling without having to commit to the scope of a full sweater or cardigan. So I was extremely excited. I spent many an evening scroll, scroll, scrolling, sorry, sorry Nordland's Ravelry because she has so many of these collars, you know, from fingering weight to DK worsted weight. And then I actually ran across something that said she has a YouTube channel. So I clicked on her most recent collar and she was wearing it in the YouTube. And then I was just sold because it was so gorgeous. I decided to cast that one on and it was on sale with her introductory discount. It is the Moonflower collar. And I just, I just really love it. It is so beautiful. Now, all that enthusiasm went into just full steam ahead and casting it on. And I was like, you know, I don't even need to gauge swatch because it's this small thing. It really doesn't matter. Um, and I decided to use this. And if, again, if you've been watching my channel, you know this yarn has kind of tortured me. This is, again, the Hedgehog Fibers Tweety. It is the leftovers from this. I've said this before, I have found that Andrea Maury gives you a way generous yardage, which is nice because you're not gonna run out of yarn. However, I have so much left over of this. I have this bit and I have two full skeins. And because like I was saying earlier, this is kind of an itchy fabric that it creates. I'm hesitant to turn that into a garment, but I figured this is the perfect yarn for this because it's always going to have something under it. It's never gonna be against my skin, maybe a little bit on the collar, but even that will be kind of loose. But because it'll have like this super soft layer under it, I feel like it's the perfect opportunity to enjoy this beautiful yarn. I mean, really, look how fun this yarn is. If it weren't itchy, it would be one of my favorite pieces because it's just so fun. You get this really neutral gray with all these pops of recycled fiber that they do this Tweety with. So here is what it looks like so far. Basically, let's see if I can spread it out enough to see. Yeah, there you go. This is what it looks like so far. It's got this beautiful cabling that kind of is, makes like a diamond shape. And then you're starting to see the cables come together on the sides. So you basically 
cast on and then you're doing some increases and then that's the first chart and then the second chart is just the rectangle of the bottom and then I believe you pick up stitches and do the front panels connect finish that off and then you do the turtleneck um I cannot I am not lying when I tell you guys I started this at least 10 times and ripped it out and again if I could just slow my roll, I get so excited, but if I could have just really mindfully and closely read the directions first, it would have saved me so much time in the long run because I don't know why, and this just twisted my brain into a pretzel, even though it's so it's such a small thing. She has you cast on, and then you go directly into the chart, but the right side rows are evenly numbered and the wrong side rows are oddly numbered, which is exactly the opposite of what most patterns are in my opinion or in my experience. And in the chart, rather than starting from right to left, she says in the body of the text, start on the wrong side from the other side. So all from left to right. And I did not read that and I was completely mixed up. Like my, I was reading the wrong way. So all the cables were in the wrong, it was just an absolute mess. And it took me so long, it took me several times to figure out I did that. It's like all my mistakes just took me too long to figure out. And it was just, I learned the hard way that you just are better off taking like 15 minutes of silence with nothing, like no podcasts or TV or anything to like properly read the introductory paragraphs so that you know what this designer is asking of you. Because I have never done a pattern of cabling for her. I've done a lace weight hat and I had no problems. There were no false starts on that, but somehow this guy just, I almost just scrapped the whole thing, but I wanted this, I love this idea of a collar so much and I wanted to experiment with it for myself as well as for you guys, because I feel like if it looks cute in the way I'm hoping it looks cute, then it would be a really nice, mid-range project you know we have our tiny projects like the socks and then we have these big shawls and sweaters but i love mid-range projects like a hat and it felt like this could be a nice other project so all that to say i'm really glad i stuck with it what i did yesterday is i blocked off an hour of time i just had complete silence i just sat with the pattern and my iPad so that I could look, like to memorize the cables in the pattern. It's just, it's a lot at the beginning. It was so slow because, you know, the different cables and the different, you know, so two by one and two by one with pearl and it's just a lot. But once you get the hang of it, it's so easy and it flows really well, but you have to give yourself that first couple of rows of just fumbling through it where you're like a baby learning how to walk. You know what I mean? Where it's just like one step, two step. And now I'm at the point where I'm just like, I want to sit down and just knit nothing but this. This is all I want to work on because it's, it's such a reward when you train your brain to decode this thing that has been so challenging and it feels so good to become proficient at it that now I'm like completely obsessed and I just love the way it's turning out. Like, doesn't that look gorgeous? And I think once um, I wet block it, all that, all those stitches are going to relax into their place and it's just going to be so fun and cool. Um, again, this is the back, but it, the same kind of patterns are in the front. And I'm just really excited. If I love this, she's got a moonflower hat and a moonflower sweater. I don't know if I'm ready for the sweater. I'm really scared I would run into the same problem where I get bored with all that 
repetitive cabling, but maybe it was just the Clarette sweater was specifically that way because it just had all these Vs. Um, it wasn't, there was no variation in that. And a lot of hers are, you know, there's a panel of honeycomb or moss stitch and then big cables and small cables. And maybe that would keep it interesting. Please tell me if you have um, more cabling experience than I do, like in a bigger, in these bigger cabled sweaters. There are so many that just make my heart sing because they're so beautiful. I have several that I need to just do a cable episode where I share them because there's too much to talk about right now. But I'm very excited about this piece. I'm possibly gonna take this on my Portland trip too, depending on the proficiency I develop over the next couple of days. Um, I do think maybe a hat would be a better option just because I don't know that I wanna be picking up stitches and all that. So anyway, we shall see. But I was really, really excited to show you this piece because I think it's just, it's unique. I know, I think Petite Knit has a couple of collars, but I just love, sorry, Nordland's more intricate ones. Maybe it's more of a European thing than it is an American thing to wear that. I do think a couple of hers kind of tread into bib category and I really don't want to look like I'm walking around with a bib. That is not the look I'm going for. Like, I'm such a mess. <laughs> I have to have my own bib for, you know, the messes I make while eating. But I think this one safely doesn't look like that. Um, I guess we're going to find out. Um, anyway, so I was very excited to share my excitement with you guys about that. Okay. Believe it or not, that's not even all the content I have, but I'm really exhausted of, of talking now, and I'm sure you're exhausted of listening now. So let's leave our knitting content here and segue into just a little life. If you do not want to hear about life, then I will see you next week. If you are up for life and books and TV and movies, then... Let's do that for a few minutes before I let you get back to your lovely lives. Um, I, My daughter and I are going to Portland next week, and I guess we leave Friday morning. It's President's Day here in the States. My son has a basketball tournament, so and my husband is going to be traveling for work, so she and I are going to go. And we're really due for some gal pal time, as we like to call it, some one-on-one -on -one. Um, I think sometimes your older kids can take up a lot of the oxygen in your family and it's hard uh, to have, you know, I just, I, I like to carve out some time where it's just her and I so that my super, you know, chatty 14 year old does not just take up all the bandwidth. Um, and we took that trip to Rhinebeck in 2022, and that was just the first time that it was just her and I, and we had so much fun. It was so bonding that I just, I'm really excited for this trip where it's just her and I, and he's not staying with us, he's staying with his team, and she and I will get to stay in a nice hotel and eat dinners and, you know, explore the absolutely fun city that Portland is meant to be. And I'm really looking forward to that. I've never been to Portland, or at least not since I was like really little, like 12. I feel like my family took a trip then, but it's been a hot second. So I'm really looking forward to it. If you have any um, suggestions for anything, please send them my way. I would be so grateful. One of the things, possibly the thing I'm the most excited about is going to the yarn shops there. Ritual Dyes is in Portland. Starlight Knitting Society, is that what it's called? That's there. There's several yarn shops in the area. I do feel like it's similar to Boulder in that way because Boulder has way more yarn shops than its size would, you know, normally you would think a, a town as small as Boulder would not have like five yarn shops, but we do, and it's magical. But I love yarn tourism, and they have 
a huge bookstore, Powell's, I believe it's called, like that's historic. And I'm just, I'm so excited. I, I'm really, really excited about that. So I'm, and I, I just love travel knitting so much. I don't know why, but like, I just feel like there's something so special about travel knitting because you're just like a captive audience. You can't go fold a you know, load of laundry. You can't go cook. You can't walk the dogs. You can't do all the gazillion things that normal life has. You're stuck in this metal tube, you know, in the sky. And all you can do is knit and listen to podcasts or books. This is like my personal heaven. So I'm very excited. You know, like some people would be excited about what restaurants they were going to eat or whatever. But for me, it's like, what am I going to knit? So I'm really excited to, you know, really nail that down, what I'm going to knit on the trip. Um, what else? That's what's in my future that I'm excited about. As far as regular life, we've been watching The Gilded Age, and I am loving that show, you guys. If you were Downton Abbey fans, then you're in for a treat if you haven't already watched The Gilded Age. I was obsessed with Downton Abbey and I have a special place in my heart because kind of halfway through the series is when my daughter was born and I just remember so many nights in that old house that we lived in where she was up in the middle of the night and I was nursing her and then trying to put her back to sleep and she was just this baby that wanted to be held all the time at every hour of the night. And I just remember sitting on this big couch and we had this big living room with this wall of windows. And uh, I would just sit there cross-legged with her in my lap and watch Downton Abbey like in the middle of the night because it's like so soothing and quiet. And so it's just been a real treat to have something so similar to that because it's the same director or whatever. It's just set in New York and it has a very similar vibe, kind of an upstairs, downstairs vibe, but you know, with all the society issues of New York rather than, you know, the manners that Downton Abbey was set in. So I am loving that, especially because we watched a lot of, we got on a good streak of really intense crime dramas. Like we watched the first two seasons of Fargo, you know, while we were really sick in January. Um, we started at the beginning and really enjoyed that. Really violent, but dark comedy, kind of suspenseful crime drama. Um, enjoyed those two, but then I really needed a break from that because it has a very, even though the storylines are different, each season has a similar tone to it. And I was kind of needing a variation. And then we watched Griselda on Netflix with one of my favorite actresses, Sofia Vergara. I love her. I think she's so incredibly talented and beautiful and we love her on Modern Family, but I loved watching her in this like really intense, violent role of a mob boss, basically. I, I really enjoyed it. We both did. It was really fun to watch Griselda. Um, and now we're watching The Gilded Age. So uh, lots of good TV. We tried to watch The Bear on Netflix, especially because after whatever award ceremony and it just cleaned up, but I cannot get into that show. It's just, I cannot get into that show. I don't know why. If you loved it, please tell me if I should try again, but this would be the third time. The first time I couldn't even get through the first episode, but we got through a couple. It just didn't keep our attention. I think my husband would have kept watching it, but I was over it. Um, and then we also watched um, what's it called? Dan Levy. He's so adorable. I love him so much. He, oh, Good Grief. It was called Good Grief. That was a very easy name to remember. Also on Netflix, it's a movie that he directed and produced and it was good. I had high expectations. It wasn't great, but I did find it very entertaining. It kept my attention. The mark of a, of anything on the TV is Will I pick up my iPad and start looking at Ravelry? 
If I don't, then I will recommend it to you because 99% of the things I watch, I'm like, I would rather also be looking at patterns on my iPad, but this, I had my attention very well um, focused on the movie. And also, I think this movie contributed to my Cable's obsession because he has this cream colored cabled sweater that he's wearing in a lot of it and i was obsessed and i wanted that for myself i wanted like this oversized cozy cream colored cabled sweater to just throw on over my pajamas because that's what he kind of does in that movie and i loved it and I'm itching that, I'm scratching that itch right now with this, but I'm hoping I can build up the stamina to make myself a full-on cabled sweater. <sighs> so many words, so many words. The last thing I will tell you is I'm reading Unsheltered by Barbara Kingsolver, and I've really enjoyed it. I'm almost done, and I am very excited to tell you guys one of you, I should have looked this up before. I want to say maybe it was Jen. I don't remember who it was. I apologize. But after my book review episode, you had said, this, this subscriber had said, um, she didn't, she didn't have audible book or audio books accessible to her. And then for some reason she couldn't read physical books. And I was communicating with her and saying, you know, I know there's a way to check out audiobooks from your local library. And in an effort to kind of explore that for her, I downloaded the app, it's called Libby, and I messed around. I'm the most incompetent person when it comes to things like this, but I was determined to try to figure it out. And it was so easy. And I realized how easy it is to check out audiobooks from your library. So what I did was literally just searched for eight or nine of the audiobooks that I'm wanting to read, and none of them were available. All of them had like a wait list, but I just put myself on all of their wait list. And before I knew it, like in a few days, this Barbara Kingsolver book, it was like, you're next in line. Do you want to check it out? And I was like, okay, let's give this a try. And I checked it out and downloaded the app. It was so easy to, you know, coordinate the app, like the books, the library part to my phone to listen to it. And it's a beautiful interface. I was really impressed to the point where I put my Libro FM membership on hold because like what I actually really liked about it is I'm not sure I would have ever read this book if it weren't for me just trying to dig into my favorite author's archives and kind of just randomly click on books because normally if I want to read a book, I just I'm like, oh, that book looks amazing. So I go buy it and instantly it's mine. Whereas again, when you're working from the library, you kind of have to work with what's there. And I ended up you know, getting unsheltered and absolutely loving it. And what I have loved about it is number one, Barbara Kingsolver is amazing. I She is possibly one of my favorite authors. And what I loved is that I had no idea what this book was about, only that she wrote it. And I went, I rarely get to read books and literally not know what they're about. So it was just such an interesting way to receive this novel, especially this novel, because it kind of, it toggles, well, you know what? I'm not gonna tell you. All I will say is I really enjoyed it, and maybe you too wanna just jump into it without knowing anything about it. You do so with my wholehearted endorsement. I'm almost at the end, and only at the end am I like, okay, I feel like a few spots are dragging just a little bit, like I didn't need as much exposition in certain spots, but overall I have enjoyed it so much. And now I have several other books that have been, I've gotten messages like, you know, this, you're next up. So, and the other thing you can do is say, um, you know, just drop me down one on the list. Like I'm not quite ready to read it, um, but I think I'll get it again in a week. So 
such a fantastic resource rather than having to buy every book you read. I am so excited. So again, this is only because of you guys that I even explored this. So I hope if, you know, buying audiobooks becomes cost, it's not cost effective, right? To spend whatever, 12 to $15 every single time. And if you're like me and you just speed through books, it gets expensive. So I am thrilled to welcome Libby into my life. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking. We're at the hour mark. It's absurd. You are far too generous with your time and you let me ramble on and on. But it's just, there's so much to share with you guys. So I appreciate you letting me into your lives. If this is your first time here, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe. If you are a regular viewer, I am so grateful for you. You have no idea how much you enrich my life and I hope to add something small to yours as well. I will see you next time, my friends. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon.